Good afternoon, saints of God. This is Peter Michael Martinez, and thank you for joining me here on the Sea of Galilee. It is always a privilege for me to speak to you from Remnant House, the home of the strong and very courageous. And we are truly a blessed house of very dedicated people. We had a we had a bit of a head count this week, and you know the Bible tells us in Luke chapter. 10 that he sent them out two by two and the 70 came back with joy because the demons were subject to them and and the king said uh, do not marvel that the devils are subject to you that the spirits are subject to you but instead that your names are written in the lamb's book of life and so we're so thankful and grateful for every member of remnant house that makes these broadcasts possible and continues to stand in faith in prayer and in believing in every way that uh, the mission that we're on to gather the remnant is just there's just nothing else more important i mean when you think about it in light of the coming of the kingdom what could be more important than the gathering of yahuwah god's people in preparation for the day of the coming of the king. And so whether they are Jew or Gentile, bond or free, uh, you know, white, black, or anything in between, the Lord is calling his people. And this is not something that is done by natural man, but in the inward man. And that is who Israel is. Israel is made up of every tribe and tongue out there in the world has Israel sprinkled inside. And so the question is not whether you're called, the question is, are you chosen? And you know how you know the difference between the called and the chosen? I learned this a long time ago. The difference between the called and the chosen is very simple. Everyone gets called. The chosen show up. Amen. And so when you're being called by the Lord, lots of people are being called. But you know that you're chosen because you show up. There is something extra that happens and he ensures that you arrive. Amen. Today, we're going to talk about something that is on the lips of a lot of people across the world. There's a lot of discussion going on uh, concerning the great tribulation. That's right. There's a lot of talk right now about great tribulation that is going on in the world. And I want to talk to you about the great tribulation deception because many people are not aware of the truth about what Messiah actually warned us about and what you're dealing with right now. And so I pray that this broadcast gives you some wisdom and understanding about the days that you're in. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, Messiah was asked a specific question. He was asked, when will these things be and what will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? And his answer a uh, very pointed answer. You know, when Messiah is asked a question and you are interested in the answer, my suggestion is that you wait for the answer and listen carefully. Um, because when he tells you something, he is not mincing words. He is telling you the truth that sets men free. Amen. Remember that he is the truth. And when he speaks, he is speaking the truth in love always. And so he sat on the Mount of Olives and in verse four, chapter uh, uh, 24 of the book of Matthew, he said, take heed that no man deceive you. Now, I want you to stop for a moment and think about deception. Deception is something that happens in your mind. If you watch a magician and he makes you think that something's in his right hand when really it's in his left. Or uh, you remember, he, he, uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 about the cunning craftiness of men where they lie and wait to deceive. Uh, they use tricks. They use things that are meant to make you look one place and in reality, the truth is somewhere else. That's the whole nature of deception, is it makes you think something over here is right, when in reality, it is something else. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, meaning that he is in fact the anointed one. Yes, they will acknowledge that he is the son, but that's as far as they'll go, because then they will begin the deception. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. Where is this trouble that he's saying that you shouldn't be? It's in your mind. Keep that in mind. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then he goes on to describe the things that you will see. And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. 
and many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and false speakers and preachers and prophets will rise and deceive many and iniquity lawlessness will abound the love of many will wax cold but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved right and so we know this and then he says then this gospel of the kingdom what gospel the gospel of the kingdom let's stay focused the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations then shall the end come all right so we see that there's a great amount of of uh, signs and wonders and things and and indications that are going to tell us that we're in this situation that we're in this time and of course we're seeing all these signs every one of these signs are magnifying right now in this hour but i want you to pay attention to verse 21 because in verse 21 of matthew 24 messiah coins a phrase that has been used as part of a great deception and we're going to sp- we're going to uh, sit down on this for a little bit of time and we're going to spend a little bit of time here in a little bit of a study and a little discussion because i believe you're going to get revelation and understanding and for those that have ears to hear and eyes to see you will come to a place of peace that passes all understanding and after all that is the true fruit of appropriate ministry is that you walk in the peace of almighty god amen if you're if you're increasingly getting more and more stressed and stressed and stressed and stressed out guess what guess what Guess who's not there? The Prince of Peace. Amen. Remember that the Prince of Peace steadies our heart, steadies our feet, strengthens our hand, puts strength in feeble knees, puts steel in our back and a sharp sword in our hands that we may not be afraid. But you see, there's a lot going on right now that is meant to make you just that, afraid. Now look what he says. He says, Uh, that for then shall be great tribulation. Now, you think you know what that word means. I'm sure you do, because most people have heard people talk about this concept and what it is, and they have just assumed so much. But today what we're going to do is we're going to actually take a look at the word tribulation. And this word in the Greek is thlipsis. Now, Thlipsis is not the same as persecution. Just understand that. We're going to talk about what this is. This word thlipsis means a pressing, a pressing together, or pressure. Metaphorically, it means oppression, affliction, distress, or to be in a tough spot or in a what would be considered uh, in straits. So you're burdened, you're afflicted, but this is mental. Please understand that this word is almost always in its context used to indicate a mental state. Hear this now. It's a pressure. Now, you may say, well, uh, explain this a little bit further. Well, I'll be happy to. (laughs) Amen. I have met people that are under enormous pressure. In fact, we just brought someone on our team here in Israel that when I heard their situation, I said, Lord, what should I do? And the Lord just put it in my heart to relieve their tribulation. And so they weren't sleeping. If you've ever been struggling with uh, situations that uh, distress you, they'll steal your sleep. It will cause you to lose all kinds of peace. You will walk around with hands that are sweaty and nothing's happening to you physically. There's nothing for you to physically see. It is all in your mind. Everything you're experiencing is all in your imagination. I've, I've heard some, from so many people that are, that are up all night. I look on Facebook and people and I realize I look at my watch and go, wait a second. You guys should be asleep. Why aren't you asleep? Because you are under great pressing. There is great pressure on you. And you're you're looking into all kinds of things. There's a distress that is going on right now. And this distress is mental. And you need to understand the difference between the mental pressures, the mental oppression that is come versus physical persecution in the flesh now there is a different word for that persecutions is a different word and in this difference if you will we start to understand how these things actually work 
So we're going to take a look at that because if you look at the word persecution, okay, so when you start to see him talking about affliction and persecution in, in Mark chapter 4, he uses both words and he talks about that there will be times of persecution. Now, persecution is not tribulation, although the threat of persecution is tribulation. I hope that didn't, I didn't lose you on that. Okay, so persecution, meaning someone is putting you, diagmos is the Greek word, and it means to put you physically in danger. Okay, so your persecution is a physical danger. In other words, somebody is coming to take your life. Somebody is trying to steal your your things. Someone is, um, uh, you know, there there's uh, there are groups out that are that are coming to steal, kill, and destroy. That is persecution. You know, when you hear about these Iraqis that had to run because ISIS was coming to kill them and they were killing people, the uh, um, that's a persecution. That's great persecution, but that's not what Messiah said. God, God is very specific in his word about the words he chooses. And we should be very careful to look at the words he actually uses. Yes, there's great persecution in the earth. There is. There is a lot of persecution in the earth. But don't confuse persecution with great tribulation. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Don't confuse persecution with great tribulation tribulation they are two different things this word tribulation deals with mental pressure this is in your head this is where fear takes over this is where it steals your sleep or gives you a dread and it is something that you are battling in your mind it is literally the battlefield of the mind Okay, and like I said, in Mark chapter four, he talks about that persecution will rise when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word. So you will some in some cases experience both, but we're not talking about persecution necessarily today. What we're talking about is the great tribulation, the great tribulation, that specific word that has been coined as a phrase to describe the days preceding the coming of the king. The great tribulation, and this is the same word used in the book of Revelation about those that come out of great tribulation. So what are they coming out of? And this is where it's incredibly important. One of the things I learned many years ago is that when someone is tossed between two a decision, when they're trying to make a decision between two options, it is very painful. This is the reason why sales professionals are taught to give you a third option in the middle and steer you toward it to relieve the pain of deciding. The reason why the news is such a popular program is because it does its, it does the thinking for you. It draws conclusions for you. Uh, many times people want someone, please just put me out of my misery and tell me the answer so that essentially I can make a decision between these two points of information. In fact, aren't we back in the garden where we're having to discern between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where we're constantly tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and cunning craftiness, whereby men lie in wait to deceive. That's why we speak the absolute word of truth in love. This way, it relieves the mind. Ah, that's the truth. Ah, this is a rock. This doesn't move. It's not shifting sand where one day it's here and the next day it's over here, which is extremely stressful. And I want to tell you that a lot of people are under this stress because they are vacillating between two opinions. What was it that Elijah, the spirit that comes immediately preceding the coming of the king, what was he known for? He was known for bringing all of Israel to a spot where he said, how halt you between two opinions? If Baal be God, then serve him. But if Yahuwah be God, then serve him. And Israel answered him not a word. Why? Because they needed the matter resolved. One of the biggest problems people are struggling with right now is just being resolved to know exactly which direction to go. They have a foot here and a foot there. This puts you in a place of great pressure. This is why it is better for you to be hot 
or cold because if you are in between, you will have anguish of soul. This is not a good place to be. Anybody that's been in Thlipsis, anybody that has had to choose between uh, two relationships or had to choose between a direction, one direction or another, or as a family that is going in two different directions, maybe you have two visions operating in the same house. We otherwise call that division or division. That there is nothing more stressful than trying to decide between one direction or another. As a matter of fact, the biggest challenges that people are facing right now are not physical. I mean, it's frankly, it's easier to get away from physical persecution than it is to get away from thlipsis. Yes, it's easier. You can get on a plane and get out away from that. People, as much as it was horrible to see that those were being persecuted, but there were hundreds of thousands that got away. What did they do? They started moving. They got out of there, physically got out of there. But how many know that the real pressure, the press, the tribulation was not physical. It was now mental. It was the notion, the thought, the idea of the loss, the idea of the thing that they, had for, that they had to forsake in order to save their lives. And so um, what was it that was the great pressure for Lot's wife? It was the notion that everything that she had worked for, that they had built, they had accumulated, was all gone. She couldn't help it. She turned back to look at Sodom and Gomorrah and was vaporized. And all that was left of her was a pillar of salt. It was a little salt tablet. And so saints, this is why it's so important for us to understand accurately the word of the Lord, especially when he uses specific words. And he said, for then shall be great tribulation. Such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Tribulation, he said, not that and then shall be great persecution. He could have used that word. He could have used that Greek word instead to say that there would be just bloodshed everywhere. And so in the West, what they have is a smoke and mirrors game going on that is just got you all frozen. They don't have to kill anybody. All they do is show you a couple of dead bodies on a screen and that's good enough. They don't actually have to carry out any of the threats. All they got to do is keep threatening you. They don't actually have to do anything. Anybody that's ever been oppressed in an oppressive relationship, all the oppressor has to do is threaten you. And that oppression comes right on you. Immediately, that person is now feeling the, the pressure of making a choice. And the oppressor, the oppressor, the abuser is pushing you to make the choice they want you to make. And so you have to be willing to stand up to that in order to get out of it. In order to get break free from an oppressive, occult, evil relationship. If you've got a, a person in your life that's abusing you and using manipulation or witchcraft to get you to do what they want you to do. The only way to break free from that, and it's a big mental battle, it's not physical, it's mental. It might be somewhat physical. I mean, you, have to, you might have to run, you might have to fight physically, you might have to call for help. But the real battle, the real battle, and everybody knows this, anybody that works in counseling, anybody that works in ministry and pastoral care knows that the real battle is breaking free from the mental attachment, from the going back and forth from the decision to be in that relationship to begin with. And in fact, what's really being abandoned is not the actual relationship, but a dream of what it could have been or what you thought it might be. Many people stay in bad relationships, not because they really are still in love with that other person, even though they're, they're cheating on them or doing all kinds of horrific things, but because they, they continue to hold on to a dream, a vision, a painted game. In fact, that's how abusers continue to re, uh, grab their their victims. Is the you know they they apologize and repaint the vision, repaint a picture of a of a wonderful future, and then they dangle that in front of you as if it's a carrot at the end of a stick. Saints, this is exactly the kind of game that Lucifer plays with the minds of the masses using things like television and video and news and media of all kinds and, and movies and, and every form of deception to paint pictures. This is the great tribulation. In fact, it began right in the garden, as I've been saying for years, the greatest, most life-costing event. When you think about 
the thing that cost more lives than any other single event in human history had no knives, no guns, no swords, no bullets, no bombs, no uh, war. It was an argument. It was a question. It was thlipsis, pressure. It was a tug of war between two opinions. One, Yahuwah God's commandments. Do not do it. Don't touch that tree. The other side, hath God really said? God knows that as soon as you do, you won't die. You're going to know things you didn't know before. And now the pressure's on. Adam and Eve came under the ellipsis, great tribulation. They were suddenly in pressure. What will they do? You see, as long as they didn't have any option, as long as the option wasn't there, they were at peace. They didn't have to deal with any pressure because the decision was made. When you make a decision, it's peaceful. Haven't you ever noticed that it doesn't matter whether you made the right choice or the wrong choice, just so long as a choice is fully made, there's a peace at the end of it? Why? Because it's over. The debate is over. You can now move forward in a direction. Whether or not it was the right direction no longer matters. What matters now is this wonderful peace that you're enjoying now that the matter is resolved. The reason for that is because it's when you're in that place of deciding between two things. It is the same chemical process going on in your brain as when you are in physical pain. There is no difference. There is absolutely no difference between the two. And so you're experiencing physical pain, even though you're physically not in pain. In fact, some people get so stressed by being in between two places that their bodies do physically start to feel it where you lose sleep, lose appetite, um, find yourself struggling, emotional, difficult to get along with, oppressed, depressed. Why? Because you're really, what your real problem is, is you're trying to decide. You're trying to make up your mind. And this is a real battle. This is where the real fight is going on. It is a battlefield of your mind. And he said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. And so he told us that there was going to be a great pressure time, a great time of deciding, a separating of two groups that you're going to have to make up your mind and it's going to be hot or cold and that's it. And see, everybody wants to be in the hot group, but they don't want to have to make the choices that being in that group requires. Everybody wants to be found faithful but when it comes time to actually writing the check or going to the thing or praying or whatever it is that God is asking you to do, that's when the battle ensues. It's easy to say, oh yes, I'm in, but it's another thing to follow through. This is why I'm so proud of those that actually not only make a decision, but do it. Don't just hear the word, but do it. What is, what's going on when somebody not only hears the word, but does it? They've made their choice. Amen. Salah. They have chosen. They have made their decision and now they're following that decision through to its natural conclusion. When the, when the prodigal son was sitting in a pig pen, he decided, he said, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of sitting in this place. I know what I will do. I will go home and he got up and he started walking once the decision was made he was actually already at peace even though he didn't know what his father would do and so there was a pressure of not knowing there was the fear of the unknown nevertheless the decision he had peace about that decision because he knew he had made a choice many times people make the wrong choice and they say well i have peace the reason why you have peace is because at least the battle of deciding is over you have to discern between the difference between the battle of deciding and the decision itself. Amen. And so, you know, because I'm sure Eve felt, I have peace about touching this fruit. Yeah, because you now made up your mind that this is what you're going to do. And you've decided and you've gone ahead and you executed it. And then you brought Adam in on it and he made the same decision. He chose to touch that fruit. And once he chose it, there was a measure, if you will, there was a, there was a sense of, there's a, some, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the ends thereof lead to death, the Bible says. And so, boom, then it hit him. Oh, no, wait a minute, what did I do? I abandoned this other choice 
and I made this choice. Oh no, oh no, what will I tell God? What will I tell the Lord? What will I say to him when he comes? And there he came in the cool of the day. And sure enough, what starts happening? Everybody's looking for some place to hide. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. <laughs> Amen. Why? Because of the pressure. It's not just the pressure of the choice. It's the pressure of the great examination. What is it that makes this the great tribulation? Because you know the king is coming. And you know that he is going to examine when he arrives. That by itself produces great tribulation because it forces you to have to deal with choices, choices that you would have thought you had meant more to. But now you're seeing signs in the heavens. You're seeing signs of the earth. You're seeing things and you're going, oh, boy, he's coming. He's coming. And and you know what happens when you know you're going to be inspected. There's a bit of anguish that starts to occur. There's a bit of realization that perhaps you're not where you belong, where you should be acting the way you should be acting. And so that's why I believe there's so many that are right now, they're responding, and in many cases with self-destruction, sadly enough. And he told us, he said in John chapter 16, that these things I've spoken unto you, that in, my, in me you might have peace. I want to warn you ahead of time so you make your choices now, so that when you're in the situation, you don't have to make a decision in the situation. You've already made up your mind. The people that have peace right now are not people that are still deciding. They're people that have already made up their heart. They've already given their hearts over. They don't care. They, they love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen. That's why they're overcomers. The Bible tells us they overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they do not love their lives even unto death. The decision for them has already been made. That's what puts them outside the, the threat threshold because they've already made their full choice. No matter what they must face, they've made their choice. They're going in this direction. It's the people that are still in between two opinions that are in danger. The people that have already chosen hell, they've already made their decision. They're not going to go uh, toward the king and the kingdom. They already have, they have their measure of peace. They're enjoying all the heaven they're going to get. Their way of resolving it is to pretend this is all just natural stuff and none of this matters and the king isn't coming. There is no king. That's in their mind and they're hoping that their imagination is correct. That you know better. You know that they're wrong, and that's why you're under pressure. Why? Because you know that there's going to be, there's coming a reconciliation between what you're doing and what he told you to do. There's coming a time of reckoning, and you know it. There's a dread building in your heart because you know he's coming to inspect, and you want to be found faithful. There's only one problem. You haven't been. In Romans chapter 12, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy holy now why would you have to present your body a living sacrifice and holy if it was already done for you why did why would paul write anything why would peter write anything why would john write anything? why would we have seven churches being rebuked why would there be any repentance even mentioned in the new testament if it was already taken care of you know in your knower in the deep of you that that is a false doctrine that's not true the reality is the reason why the entire New Testament is filled with admonitions on behavior and how you conduct yourself is because the king will inspect. And this is really the true source of great tribulation. The true source of tribulation is dealing with him, not the enemy. It's not the devil. It's him. He is the immovable object he is the unstoppable force he's not running for king he is king and his coming approach his approaching presence his increasing presence being felt on the earth causes great distress because people have to make a choice they have to decide your body is a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service the least you can do and be not conformed to this world you know that there's a decision that has to be made not to be conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is good acceptable and perfect will of god and you see, he goes on to say, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. 
Amen. And so that's why it's so important for us to be found faithful. And he goes on to talk about conduct and how we should walk in this great anointing that we've been given. Above and beyond the commandments, for John was clear. Anyone who says they know him and keep in all the commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. And so there's this great pressure that's going on right now. And it's not the pressure of the devil. It's the pressure of the coming of the king. And knowing, where do I stand? Where do I go? What do I do? How do I feel? And those that are against him are hardening their position. I don't want him to rule my life. He's not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And you see it. You watch it. You're looking at people right now who have rebellion in their heart, who are hardening their position. And they will find a cloak of doctrine of any kind they can and they're drinking strong delusion. And then there's that other very small group, but a group nevertheless, that are saying, your will be done. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. This cup cannot pass from me, then I choose life. I choose your way, no matter what it costs me. I choose your way, no matter what they say, no matter about the faces of men. And I'm going to pass this test of the great persecution, the great tribulation, the great pressure. You see, saints, there's so much in the scripture about the difference between these two things but because they were lumped together you began to believe that tribulation has to do with people getting their heads chopped off and people um, getting shot at or um, you know being strung up and yes physically there is persecution there is but look at what it says in acts chapter 14 it's not just talking about just persecution which is real by the way there are physical things happening to people who absolutely refuse, who won't back away. Amen. In Acts chapter 14, verse 21, it says, And when they had preached this gospel in that city, had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Wait a second. Through much tribulation? Hold on a second. I thought that we we're trying to avoid the great tribulation. I thought we we're going to get raptured out of the great tribulation. No, 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 no. This is how you enter into the kingdom of, of God. You come through great tribulation. You come through this great deciding, this great div the dividing of the two flocks, whether you're a goat or a sheep. You have to come through this. You have to come through it. You have to go through this press of making decisions. Do you or don't you want to live in, in, in the kingdom? Do you or don't you want to obey his commandments? Do you or don't you want to walk in his ways? This is a choice. I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. What's great tribulation? He said, I'm, I'm putting you in great tribulation. I'm giving you two options. This is trouble for your brain unless you make a choice for life. Then Moses did something wise. He said, I adjure thee, choose life. When you choose life, peace will return to you. As soon as you choose life, peace returns. Why? Because the decision's made now. Now you've made your mind up. If you choose obedience, you know, whenever uh, I talk to people and they're giving and, I'm, and I talk to them and I interact with them and they say, oh, the Lord put this in my heart and the decision was made. And when the decision was made, I had peace. And when they had peace, they followed through easily. But people that are still battling whether they're going to be found faithful, whether they're going to go ahead and speak the word the Lord gives them. Whenever they're still between two opinions, oh boy, there's stress. Oh my goodness, the stress is amazing. If you've given two job offers and you don't know which one to take, oh my goodness. If you got, uh, if you're if you're single and you got two people interested in you, whoa, you talk about tribulation. If you're if you're deciding between whether you're going to stay in a country or leave the country, if you're trying to decide whether you're going to Israel for Shabbat or for uh, Passover or not, oh my goodness, great tribulation. Anytime you're in between two opinions, ho oh, ho, tribulation. Anytime there's a decision to be made, anytime you have to make a choice. You are thrown in the midst of affliction. And you say, well, aren't we supposed to get out of this? The way out is narrow. It's difficult. Conforming, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith, believing that which they do not see with their natural eyes, but walking by faith, meaning that which they heard, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. Amen. So believe the word you've, hear, you've heard, like Adam was supposed to do. You do it. Believe the word you've heard. And that way, through much tribulation, so when you are facing this alternate choice, you shut it down immediately and say, nope, I've already made up my mind. I'm walking with him. Nope, I've already made up my mind. I'm walking with him. 
Amen. If you are battling, for example, let's say you're battling cigarettes, right? Let's say that that's your battle or alcohol. And you, you can't avoid it. It's going to be in your society. Uh, I, I can't go to the grocery store. I can't go to the gas station without running across these things. These things are going to be in your pathway. If you're still vacillating between two opinions, you're going to be constantly tempted. But when you have made up your heart and mind on a matter, then it suddenly becomes easier and easier to walk right by these things. Why? Because the decision's already been made. It's like when you've bought a house. You might notice other houses that are for sale, but once you signed a deal and done it and closed it and have evaluated all the different options and have finally decided that this is the house for you, it settles you down. It settles you. It establishes you. It perfects you. And so it is through this process of tribulation that we all must come. And you say, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to avoid it. To avoid it is to avoid the actual decision-making process, the actual choosing. Are you seriously thinking that you're going to be able to avoid being a sheep or a goat? No, there is no avoiding that process. You must be in one or the other. Either you believe and it changes your conduct, or you say you do, think you do, act like you do sometimes, but in reality don't. The fact is, is that your believing reflects in your conduct. What did he say? He said that there's two houses, one built on the rock, one built on sand. They who hear his word and do it, built on rock. They who hear only, built on sand. The wind and rain come, knock that house down. Why? Not decided, not firm, not determined, not convinced, not fully persuaded. And so what is going on right now is, a, is an attempt by the adversary to paint a picture, especially in the West. He's doing a brilliant job in the West. The greatest tribulation is opinion. Multiple opinions being expressed in such a way that you can't make up your mind. So much is going back and forth, on and off, this or that. Is this right or is that right that you cannot make up your mind? And when you do make up your mind today, tomorrow, you, you want to be in both camps. I see this all the time. Somebody says, oh, yes, 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 I agree. But then over here, they're doing exactly the opposite. So your actions say that you don't agree, but your mouth will say, yes, yes, yes. What did the Lord say? With their lips, they praise me, but their hearts are far from me. You see, saints, we can't fool him. And there is no fooling the angels. Either you are or you are not one of his sheep. His sheep know his voice and another they don't follow. They obey what they're told and they honor him. Amen. And so this is where our peace comes in. It doesn't mean that we're going to go without difficulty because again, remember persecution. Persecution is actually when they hate you. Persecution is when they treat you differently because you follow Messiah. Persecution is when you don't get the job or you don't get promoted or you get attacked physically or you get shot at, killed in other way. In other words, uh, um, there's something that transfers from their spirit or the evil spirit realm to the natural. This is persecution. But tribulation is the deciding, the mental anguish of being between two opinions. And this is the greatest now than it has ever been because you have a huge number of people. You have all the non-believers, so that's part of the group. Then you have the fakeanity group because there's nothing else. I don't even know what to call it. But they are so far from the commandments, it's scary. Um, then you have the rationalization group that know what the commandments are, but are disobeying. And remember, iniquity is lawlessness. So this group is getting really big. And then you have those that are believing in all kinds of false gods and false religions. Okay, so they're far away from those things as well. This group is huge and lumped in with them are the disobedient. So you've got all of these people in this giant mainstream group. What do you have on the other side, on the right hand of the Father? You have believers who not only believe his word, but do it, who keep his commandments. Look at the book of Revelation. It says these are the ones that overcome. They who keep the commandments of Jesus. They keep the commandments of Yahushua HaMashiach. They keep the commandments of Almighty God. Did anything Messiah preach contrary to what his father said? Absolutely not. He affirmed the word, not one jot or one tittle. 
shall pass away. But you see, there's a battle going on, isn't there? And they're, oh, no, no, you don't have to believe that. Oh, no, no, you don't have to think about that. Oh, no, no, why? Why are they throwing you back into this sea, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine? Why are they fighting you when you're trying to just make up your heart and mind? Because that's the great tribulation. That is what it is. Yes, it manifests in physical attacks because sometimes people get so frustrated that you're not doing what they want. Think about the abuser. If any of you have ever been in an abusive relationship and you're starting to break free, breaking free is the most dangerous time. When you were compliant and doing what the abuser wants you to do, what the what the Jezebel spirit wants you to do, what the evil witchcraft spirits want you to do, then you're you're fairly safe because they're they are they're feeling control and they don't feel threatened. But when you start to break free, when you start to say I'm not doing it, that's generally when you have physical confrontations. It's because you are no longer going to let them manipulate you. And because of that, now they start to turn it into the flesh. So in the same way, the pressure comes mental. The mental pressure comes in all the countries of the world. Will you or won't you capitulate? If you capitulate, then we won't hurt you physically. The persecution will end. But if you don't, if you give in to the, if you don't give in to our pressure, if you don't give in to our thalipsis, our great tribulation, then our threat, our threat, we're threatening you, we're going to threaten you, we're going to kill you, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And so, let me just give you a word of advice. The best way to avoid persecution is to not be there, which is why the king said, when you see these things, to flee, to get out of there. Why? Because it's better to just not even be there. The best way to avoid being beaten up by your abusive ex-husband, you know, or boyfriend is to just not be there when he gets home from work. Hello. Amen. Uh, when you're still there, they take it as an invitation to abuse you. When you know you're being abused or persecuted, it's time to go. It's time to get out of that situation. And that is making a decision, saints. That is how we make our decisions. Sometimes we just vote with our feet. Amen. And so, you know, don't think that that's, there's something wrong with it or cowardice. No, there isn't. It's wise. Think of Messiah. Uh, what did Joseph and Mary do? They picked up the baby and obeyed the angel and took him to Egypt. Amen. There was a time when they were going to throw Messiah off a cliff. He didn't go into Kung Fu fighting, <laughs> you know. Instead, he walked through the midst of them. It was time to leave. Sometimes it's just time to go. Amen. And so saints, sometimes it's just time to go. It's just time to get away from that which is trying to get you to go a different way. That's why it says in the book of Revelation, come out of her, my people, time to walk away because they won't give in. This pressure is going to continue until you either capitulate. And if you don't, then the, the threats will rise. The uh, attacks will increase because they can't stand the notion that you're not doing what they want you to do. And that's what it is. It's abuse. It's abusive. When the, the king's not trying to abuse you. The king, the king frees you. He says, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. The reason why you obey the commandments is not to get saved, but because you are. Oh, there's a, there's a twist for you. There's so many people that don't get it. They think that there's something wrong when you're keeping commandments as if you're trying to earn your salvation. You see, we're, we're fixing it. I should say it's an untwist because the wickedness of the wicked is to tell you that any commandments is evil. As if the commandments could possibly be evil when they are called holy. Amen. So we need to restore our understanding back to obedience. If the wrath of God abides on the children of disobedience, then where does the peace of God abide? Selah. Amen. And then the question is obedient to what? What is it that you're supposed to be? How does he make this dividing line? How does he decide? He's a righteous judge. How will he judge? See, this is where the great pressure really comes in. It's because people don't want to be in a situation where they have to be forced to make a choice. But unfortunately, there is no way around it. Everyone, I don't care who you are, will have to make a choice. And in that final hour, you're deciding between life and death, blessing and cursing, the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of the flesh, the good news of the devil. 
You know, he's got his own good news. He's got his own messengers, his own apostles and prophets, his own pastors and teachers. Yes, he does. He's got fakes of every kind. And what are they trying to do? Make you comfortable, make you peaceful, bring you to peace with disobedience, bring you to peace with doing evil, bring you to peace in your iniquity so that you don't care that you're walking iniquity. You don't even know that that one of the tenets of Satanism is do as thou wilt, do what feels good. Hey, you know what? If that's what works for you, brother, go with that. That's a satanic doctrine. Amen. You're not being changed and transformed by that doctrine. You're being allowed to grow like a wild bush. Instead, the husband comes in, the husbander, if you will, who prunes his vineyard, comes in and says, no, you don't grow however you want. I determine how you grow. I am your overseer. I am the bishop of your soul. I am your high priest. I am the one who fashioned and made you, and I'm going to bring you to where you belong. And so if you're submitted to the spirit of the living God, then you end up where you belong. But what if you're one of those wild bushes that says, no, I don't want to submit. You're going to get plucked up and cast into the fire. And so saints, what's happening right now, that's why when I read people talking about the pre-tribulation departure, I, I chuckle because they don't get it. There is no way around it. You have to go through. Everyone does. Because tribulation is what happens when you have to make a choice. And so the question is, what have you chosen? Have you chosen life or have you chosen death? Have you chosen to obey or rebel? Have you chosen to be submitted or have you chosen witchcraft? And you say, wait a second, what do you mean by witchcraft? What are you talking about, Peter? Well, didn't you know that one of the principles of the kingdom is has to do with rebellion did you know that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft first samuel chapter 15 and verse 23 for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry that's right what is stubbornness is that physical no that's mental that's saying i won't i won't i won't when he's saying you need to come to me obey me do what i'm telling you listen to me Hear my voice. Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. I'm asking you and your stubbornness is to dig your heels in. And to him, what does he call it? Rebellion. It is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And what is the very next thing that is spoken? Because thou hast rejected the word of Yahuwah thy God, he hath also rejected thee. You see, if you don't want to be a reject, you have to be a receiver of the word, not a rebeller against it. You have to receive it. You have to say, if that's what he's saying I need to do, then that's what I'm going to do. Done. The reason why the obedient don't have this is because they don't need them. They don't evaluate his word on a case by case basis. That's not how they do it. The rebellious do that. The rebellious decide on a moment by moment whether they're going to be obedient or not. That's not what the obedient do. That's a recipe for disaster, by the way. The obedient humble heart makes a decision once and says, anything he tells me to do, whenever he tells me to do it, however he tells me to do it, I'm going to do it because I am obedient. I am going to obey him forever. No matter what he tells me, no matter where he sends me, no matter what assignment he gives me, I will do it and I will finish it and I will be found faithful. This is the group that he says, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The group that is doing it on a case by case basis, well, let me see if I like what you told me to do before I decide, then who's really God? You are. Let me see if I agree with you, Holy Spirit, before I obey, who's really the one in charge then? You are. Let me see if I understand it first before I start obeying, who's the one really in charge now? You are. And guess who's sitting in the temple? as if he is God. Hmm. Somebody's got an ego that's a little too big. As we say back in where I grew up, (laughs) is there any room in there for Jesus? (laughs) Amen. Is there any room in there for Yahusha? Is there any room in there for the Holy Ghost? Because there's so much of you on the throne making decisions for your own self that there's no room for him to lead you first. Many are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? The ones that are not ones making the decision. The decision was already made. That's why Paul calls himself a bond servant. 
And any disciple is just as his master. He doesn't do what he wants. He does what his father says. What did Messiah say? I don't do anything of myself. What? I don't do anything of myself. Say that again. I don't do anything of myself. I do as I see my father do. Amen. What does a disciple do? It is enough for a disciple to be as his master. Amen. See, that peace that comes as a result of making that choice. The choice is fully made, fully persuaded, completely given over. doesn't matter if it costs you your life. Why not? Because that's it. It's over. It's already been decided. This decision was made back here somewhere. Amen. And so, saints, if you're in a situation where you're being manipulated, then you have a choice. You have to decide whether you're going to stay in that place, halt between two opinions, and continue in a place of continuous ellipsis or tribulation, or you're going to get out of that abuse which the enemy is bringing, which the situation you're finding yourself in with the coming of the king is bringing you into a place of great tribulation. A great choosing is happening. That's what the great tribulation is the great choice. The great choice. A time of great choosing that has never been in the earth. Choosing between life and death. For as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, where they had to make a choice. As the days of Lot, where they had to make a choice. And so here we are on the threshold of the coming of the King, on, in the Jubilee year, the grand, great Jubilee year, and great pressure is on people in all seven continents to make a choice. Life or death, blessing or cursing. And the king exhorts you, be wise, choose life. God bless each and every one of you saints. And remember, Yahusha HaMashiach, he alone is king.
There is no one